We're talking today about uh, surgical and perioperative emergencies in the newborn. Um, I'm Ray Brown. As you will remember, I asked you a couple of weeks ago to review um, on our wiki the characteristics of newborn physiology and pharmacology uh, which would make an, an understanding of uh, this presentation much easier. For today, we're going to try to characterize newborn surgical conditions that require emergent or urgent treatment. We're going to try to determine the implications of emergent management within the first 24 hours of life. And we're going to review briefly that uh, physiology and pharmacology that separates newborn infants from more mature uh, children, but only briefly. After that, we'll review some of the new evidence about care of, of high acuity infants. Now, there are um, many implications of anesthesia, anesthesia management within the first 24 hours of life. These babies are, of course, not mature, whether they are preterm babies or term babies. There are issues relating to cardiopulmonary physiology um, with shunts and uh, issues with the issues with the um, myocardium, uh, renal immaturity, which um, uh, cause it to be difficult for these children to uh, clear both electrolytes and, and drugs once they've been metabolized by the liver. Um, there are, of course, congenital anomalies that we must deal with. And because of the uh, presence of an immature lung, there's immature drug handling that is um, uh, problematic. As I said, if you'll read through the wiki, um, there's a section in there, about 20 pages of uh, an evaluation and treatment of uh, these um, issues relating to uh, children in the first, 20, uh, first 24 hours of life. What is the nature of an emergency? People come to the front desk and, and they say something is an emergency. In the past, um, there were many uh, conditions of newborns in the um, in the neonatal period that were considered to be um, uh, a emergencies, meaning that they need to be done uh, within one hour, and that has certainly changed. But an emergency is a condition that requires rapid intervention in order to maintain the viability or significant well-being of the patient. And in infants, uh, that includes some uh, perioperative issues but for the most part, that deals with the physiological conditions that are related to the prematurity of organ systems with the, uh, in the neonate or the premature infant. Uh, acute respiratory failure uh, occasionally is an uh, issue of an emergent issue uh, in the newborn. This is usually caused by a, a decrement in uh, surfactant that is present for or within the newborn uh, lung. In the extremely premature infant, this may uh, relate to um, anatomic Im immaturity with a failure of development of many of the uh, saccular um, issues within the lung parenchyma. There are also, life-threatening congenital anomalies um, that are present in the newborn um, and which are seen in the delivery room, these usually involve the airway um, the, or the heart, and um, they become very characteristically um, apparent uh, very, very uh, quickly once the child is delivered. In twins, um, significant anemia can uh, be an, an issue. Twin-twin transfusion uh, causing extreme anemia in one infant 
uh, followed by a, a second infant, which will have such a high hemoglobin and hematocrit that they risk an infarct or stroke, infarct or stroke, and cardiac disease that produces profound hypoxia and relies on a PDA for survival is often emergently uh, determined in the um, in the delivery room. Then there are relative surgical emergencies. I say relative because in the past, whereas many of these uh, infants would have been bought, brought to the uh, operating room within literally hours of uh, being born, these uh, children are, are often um, stabilized in the neonatal intensive care unit for hours or days prior to being brought to the um, operating room for repair of these surgical conditions. That is because some of these conditions, uh, such as diaphragmatic hernias, have been found to, um, in fact, have a better survival when those children are stabilized um, prior to the time that they come to the operating room. So, in terms of the relative surgical emergencies, we have uh, diaphragmatic hernias, um, which should have been picked up on a prenatal ultrasound, uh, tracheoesophageal fistulas, uh, which may not have been picked up on a prenatal ultrasound. It was often picked up by nurses uh, trying to pass a feeding tube in the, in the nursery. Gastroschisis, which is uh, becoming more common as is omphalocele, and then there will be myelomeningocele, um, or other spinal dysraphisms that, that uh, occur um, um, and should, should be picked up by ultrasound. I say should be picked up, but remember that, that there are many uh, babies in our population that moms have not had prenatal care and therefore have not had ultrasounds and therefore um, the presence or absence of these congenital conditions are not known and we only are aware of them at the time of birth. This uh, places uh, much pressure on the infant uh, for survival and on the um, uh, pediatric anesthesiologist to, uh, to manage a, a child that is uh, physiologically unstable. The most important of the neonatal emergencies, and when we get outside of the, of the um, immediate uh, birth issues, uh, the most important of the neonatal emergencies is abdominal sepsis or necrotizing enteral colitis. Necrotizing enteral colitis is, is interesting. It is common and it is uh, most commonly found in preterm uh, infants, although it can be found in um, children that are term uh, who have anomalies of their vascular system. Uh, within their uh, gut. Caused by reduction in, in bowel blood flow leading to um, ischemia and sometimes infarction, um, if there is a, a reduction, um, a, ma a massive reduction in blood flow and an infarction, um, then that will be followed usually by uh, abdominal sepsis um, in which case the infant that you will be taking care of in the operating room will be, will be in fact, quite, quite sick. The treatment of these after uh, conservative management, and by conservative management I'm speaking of uh, not feeding the child, uh, putting in a, um, a naso or orogastric tube uh, antibiotics and um, uh, assuring that the child's uh, physiologic parameters are normal. But the after, after this, if the, if the disease process continues to um, move along, the treatment is uh, surgical, and it's certainly surg surgical if an, inf an infarction is present. In the sickest of the premature infants, this uh, may 
uh, require, because of their physiologic instability, the, the placement at the bedside in the nursery of a, uh, a drain under local anesthesia. But usually the, the surgical treatment is uh, removal of the infarcted segment um, and uh, only by doing that and washing out the gut um, and the abdominal space can uh, the child then become hemodynamically stable and clear the sepsis. Concurrent with the surgical treatment, of course, the medical therapy includes antibiotic therapy uh, and further treatment of the sepsis. Interestingly, dopamine has been used to support pressure in uh, abdominal sepsis for the last 25 years or more. Recent, uh, a recent study uh, demonstrated that, in fact, norepinephrine was probably a better drug to, uh, to treat uh, massive hypotension associated with uh, abdominal sepsis. Remember that, that all enteral feeds will need to be discontinued and that uh, some of the enteral feeds may in fact be um, out in the, um, in the abdominal space. Things that portend bad outcome include systemic acidosis and um, intravascular uh, coagulation, um, replacement of blood products with fresh frozen plasma, um, elevating fibrinogen, and occasionally using um, other um, coagulation agents may be required, but the major way of treating disseminated intravascular coagulation is, of course, to remove the infarcted uh, bowel, uh, stabilize the abdominal sepsis, and treat systemic acidosis, maintaining or improving the, um, the child's uh, hemodynamics. This is a uh, an image from the New England Journal of Medicine which shows thickening of the bowel um, and you can see from this image uh, what, uh, a ch what a neck looks like um, in uh, a child that has a pretty severe involvement. You can also see at the upper left a, uh, a picture of uh, intrahepatic air um, which uh, suggests that there has been um, some sort of uh, rupture of the bowel. This, uh, in fact, shows uh, a large uh, fixed loop of bowel, uh, which is another uh, way of uh, that this uh, necrotizing enterocolitis uh, presents. I want to talk for a few minutes about congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Um, CDH is a, a very important disease process for uh, pediatric surgeons and pediatric anesthesiologists. Um, it used to be considered the most significant of the uh, congenital um, emergencies. Uh, as I said before, uh, many times now these children are, are taken to the uh, nursery and stabilized. If their physiology, their pulmonary physiology is uh, too uh, problematic, uh, occasionally they may be placed on ECMO um, so that they can provide adequate oxygenation um, until such time as they will be able to be safely taken to the operating room. This figure on the right from the New England Journal of Medicine shows you um, perhaps why this um, entity, congenital entity, is uh, problematic. And that is because during the course of uh, development, um, the open left diaphragm, most commonly, uh, in, invites um, entrapment of the abdominal contents in the lung space.
the outcome of this is that um, there is no room for the de adequate development of uh, the lung and this uh, lung when looked at uh, pathologically will appear quite dysplastic. Of interest is that the contralateral lung is often dysplastic also. Um, the left Hemi diaphragm is the most usual involved uh, in uh, congenital diaphragm granite hernia. The incidence in uh, newborns is a, a, about 1 in 2200 births and that, that is really relatively stable. Uh, many uh, children with congenital diaphragmatic hernia um, are, are miscarriages um, and that appears to be about uh, 1 in 5,000. 76% of these children have um, polyhydramnios or present with polyhydramnios, um, but that's uh, associated with uh, only about 11% survival. 80% of these lesions are left-sided, as I said, 1% are bilateral. Bilateral uh, is uh, almost uniformly fatal. About 50% of these children have cardiac or chromosomal lesions. Uh, the uh, coincidental appearance of uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia with um, congenital cardiac disease or uh, trisomy 18 or such um, would be considered to be extremely lethal. I want to talk for a few minutes about uh, polyhydramnios since it's a a very frequent uh, indicator of congenital uh, diaphragmatic uh, hernia, but that's not the only thing that it might portend. In fact, um, we have many patients that have uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, maternal diabetes mellitus, and those patients will all uh, have, be at risk for polyhydramnios. Of course, patients with multiple gestations with isoimmunization, pulmonary uh, anomalies, and twin-twin um, transfusions, and other fetal anomalies, such as anencephaly and uh, TE fistula, which we'll talk about uh, a min in a minute, um, also are associated. To complete that picture, oligo oligohydramniosis is occasionally a problem, and that usually relates to some issue relating to uh, the kidneys, such things as Potter's uh, syndrome, uh, renal agenesis, uh, GU obstruction, uh, or uteroplacental insufficiency. Um, as I said, the, path, the pathophysiology of uh, the congenital diaphragmatic hernia uh, has been well worked out over the years. Pulmonary hypoplasia, uh, bilaterally is is what causes the majority of the physiologic abnormality that is seen. Um, there's a reduction in the size of pulmonary vascular bed, uh, which is the greatest problem. Um, these vessels often have extensive, well-developed musculature. Um, there are a reduced number of alveoli with small alveolar size, and this all together results in uh, hypoxia, hypercarbia, shunning, and um, and because of the well-developed musculature, once these children become hypoxic, there, uh, there can be and often is a reversion to uh, fetal circulation, and um, this is very difficult uh, to reverse. Uh, these are the children that, that may need to go on to have, uh, to go on ECMO. Outcome prediction in 2016, there's about still about a 20% uh, death rate from congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Um, such things as um, looking at the pH um, will tell you something about outcome. The pH is less than 7.2 and CO2 is greater than 50 or PaO2 is greater less than 60 or the AADO2 uh, is between um, 2 to 300 or the PaCO2 is greater than 40 um, with a ventilatory index of greater than a thousand. All of those things um, portend um, 
that uh, the child is unlikely to have uh, a good uh, outcome. The clinical presentation of congenital diaphragmatic hernia um, is usually apparent in, in the delivery room, although small defects may not be apparent for 24 hours or more, or eventration, which is an incomplete diaphragmatic defect, may not be appreciated for, for some months or years occasionally. The signs in the delivery room include cyanosis, dyspnea, uh, apparent dextrocardia, and, and um, the uh, much talked about scaphoid abdomen that children have because their abdominal contents are in their chest. Many of these children will in fact have a barrel shaped chest and if you put your stethoscope on on the chest you will often hear uh, bowel sounds or certainly decreased breath sounds. Chest x-ray will show bowel in the, in the usually left chest area um, with a mediastinal shift. Um, hyperventilation and intubation and hyperventilation of these children uh, can produce um, uh, a, an emergency um, including uh, contralateral or unilateral or, unilateral or bilateral uh, pneumothoraces which can be uh, lethal in these kids. Um, the most important in the immediate um, time frame in the delivery room is gastric decompression to reduce the amount of gas that is in fact in the chest uh, caused by the, having the stomach in the chest. Um, if you attempt to mask ventilate these infants you will uh, increase the size of the stomach and um, this produces rapid respiratory embarrassment. Once this child is intubated, um, it's necessary to treat the acidosis and perfusion with, um, with fluids, uh, often pressors, uh, bicarbonate, perhaps if the pH is uh, much below 7.1, um, and then to look for associated defects. Um, as I said before, this is no longer thought of as an immediate surgical emergency. It is it can be a physiologic and often is a physiologic emergency which requires that these children are taken to the neonatal intensive care unit and stabilized prior to coming to the operating room. Bringing a child from the delivery room directly to the operating room who is uh, physiologically unstable raises the risk of a poor outcome for these children by um, uh, a thousand percent. It, anesthetic management, avoid hypothermia of course. Uh, hypothermia increases the pulmonary vascular resistance and the um, PVR is uh, going to be elevated in these babies who have these highly muscular and uh, dysplastic uh, pulmonary arteries. Um, muscle relaxants and um, narcotics are the most important anesthetic uh, management for these children uh, in order to reduce the the amount of stress that the, ch the child is under and uh, sometimes this will require 25 to 50 mics per kilo of fentanyl or other uh, opioids in order to uh, decrease stress. Uh, you want to avoid nitrous oxide um, because of its effect to increase the the size of the GI tract, which may still be in the chest. And to, to the best of your ability, you want to try to avoid reversion to fetal blood flow by uh, hyperventilating the child, um, providing for a metabolic al alkalosis and assuring uh, adequate oxygenation. ECMO is uh, an adjunctive agent for children that are uh, especially unstable. Um, nitric oxide uh, to reduce pulmonary hypertension and vascular reactivity has been tried, but uh, it, for these children, ECMO is uh, likely to be a, uh, more productive in salvaging these babies.
the surgical timing um, is, as I said, um, uh, important in that the child needs to be stable um, because the lung function, in, in fact, is going to be worse postoperatively due to a decrease in um, compliance um, and an increase in intra-abdominal pressure and displacement of the diaphragmatic position. Um, so uh, don't let somebody talk you into doing something that is not going to be in this baby's best interest. This is a picture um, from the folks at Brown Medical School of a baby who had a rather, rather large uh, diaphragmatic hernia and you can see at the yellow arrow that there are um, abdominal contents that are um, in, in the, in the um, pulmonary space. Let's talk for a few minutes about tracheoesophageal fistulas. Um, what you see here is uh, a picture uh, that, was, uh, that was taken from a bronchoscopy of, of a baby who had a, a TEF. At the top, you can see the, uh, what appears to be uh, a normal uh, trachea, and you can uh, even see off in the distance um, the dividing line between the uh, right main bronchus and the left main bronchus. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see, uh, in fact, the fistula at right? the place where it usually is, and it's posterior um, to the uh, to the trachea. Tracheosophageal fistula, I believe, is one of the most difficult neonatal cases to do. Uh, the high risk that's associated with this is because of inability to know uh, breath to breath where the tip of the endotracheal tube is. Um, and this uh, can be um, uh, problematic and requires a, a lot of uh, knowledge on the part of the anesthesiologist and really keeps you on your toes uh, while you are um, managing these babies. There's also a high risk because of association of uh, other serious congenital uh, abnormalities, especially cardiac. There's a high instance of uh, VSD uh, it, with uh, tra uh, tracheosophageal fistula. And there's a special level of risk when associated with low birth weight. Children that are less than uh, three kilos, um, and especially those less than two kilos, uh, have a high incidence of uh, poor outcome, uh, even in the best of hands. This uh, shows you a, a picture of uh, all the different types of es uh, esophageal fistulas. Uh, the, on the left is the A type, which is an esophageal atresia with a distal uh, TEF, which represents about 87% of all that we do. Um, secondly, you can see an isolated uh, esophageal atresia, um, and that's 8%. Uh, the third uh, and the picture in the middle uh, shows you isolated TEF um, without esophageal atresia. The fourth is an esophageal atresia with a proximal uh, TEF, and then the fifth is the esophageal atresia with a double TEF. And quite honestly, I, I've never seen or you know, heard of, of anyone like that. The diagram on the left-hand side of the slide uh, demonstrating an esophageal atresia with a distal TEF is, is, is the most common um, and the, the one that we actually see most commonly here. Another picture, um, the question is uh, which one of these is the trachea um, and which one of these is the fistula. As you can see, the fistula is as large as the um, the main stem uh, bronchi, and, uh, and this and this is often true. I think you can see by looking at this uh, picture why why the placement of the endotracheal tube is so difficult, and why uh, the tip uh, of the endotracheal tube uh, being left in the uh, in the actually in the uh, tracheoesophageal fistula. Uh, is, is so problematic. 
How do we induce anesthesia for these kids? Um, most infants do not tolerate spontaneous ventilation, although that has been um, called uh, the ideal way of, uh, of managing uh, children with, uh, with tracheoesophageal fistula. Um, because of the breathing, they will be breathing at a low tidal volume, hypoxia rapidly in seas. So some form of respiratory support is going to be required. Placement of the endotracheal tube under direct division into the right main skin, followed by withdrawing to just above the carina is usually effective. But as I said, and what you can see from the uh, diagrams and pictures that I've showed you before, that has to really be uh, checked breath to breath as the surgeons are um, um, doing their um, surgical procedure. The repair, most commonly repaired through a right thoracotomy to occlude the fistula. Um, it is very important that uh, the surgeon um, be able to uh, visualize the fistula first and um, get a suture around it uh, so that you can ad adequately ventilate the child. Um, it requires some reduction in ventilation of the right lung. It's often not tolerated very well. Uh, the section may uh, change the uh, position of the endotracheal tube. As I've said, it may be displaced into the fistula. And um, in fact, this can be determined by loss of entitled CO2, which is ominous. Uh, if this occurs, um, it will require often the surgeon to stop and the anesthesiologist to reconnoiter and, um, and try to place the endotracheal tube um, outside of the fistula. As I said, most neonates do not tolerate spontaneous ventilation as an induction technique. What about omphalocele or gastroschisis? Uh, which is which? Well, omphalocele, as we can see here, is a uh, dis disorder, a mainline disorder of the abdominal wall, which with an incidence of six, 1 in 6,000 to 1 in 10,000. Although that incidence apparently is increasing according to recent data from the CDC. About 25 to 30% of these infants are premature or um, have low birth weight. Um, what are the differences? Uh, Omphalocele is a herniation of abdominal contents at the base of the umbilicus due to failure of the gut to return to abdominal capacity by the 10th week of gestation. It's very complex, but that happens normally all the time in, in these babies, except in those babies that have uh, an omphalocele. The intestinal contents in the case of an omphalocele are covered by a peritoneal membrane. There are 60 to 70% associated defects, other defects of the midline uh, in, ch in children that have omphalocele. And these can include uh, malrotations, Meckel's diverticulum, other atresias in the GI tract, biliary atresia, imperforate anus, in the in cardiovascular um, sphere, um, of which about 20% of babies with omphalocele will have some sort of cardiovascular anomaly. Uh, tetralogy of flow and ASD are often seen, but BSD, of course, is the uh, most common. Children that have omphalocele are at higher risk for bladder extrophy, the cleft lip, palate, jaw, and for uh, tongue tumors. Um, they're at risk for beckwith wiedemann uh, the pentology of Cantrell and lower midline defects such as, uh, as the vesico-intestinal fistulas. Now what about gastroschisis? It looks worse but actually is not. 
the instance of gastroschisis is one of, uh, has been about one in 30,000, but again, the incidence of gastroschisis, according to the CDC, is, is rising all over the United States. About 60% of these uh, in infants who are born with the bowel completely outside of their gut uh, are premature. Their defect of their abdominal wall is to the right of the umbilicus and is due to interruption of the umphalomesenteric artery, essentially a stroke, um, an infarction of the abdominal wall. The intestinal contents are not covered by the peritoneum, and therefore there is a massive loss of uh, fluid and, and uh, heat uh, once the baby is born. There are fewer associated anomalies. Uh, most, of, most of the anomalies that there are are GI anomalies. Preoperative considerations in these babies are heat loss proportional to the size of the, the defect. Um, we often, in the case of gastroschisis, use a bowel bag to cover uh, these, um, the bowel of these, these infants. Uh, GI decompression to limit aspiration and distension with an OG tube. Uh, fluid loss from peritonitis, uh, third degree space, third space loss, pulmonary and ischemia. So, in the case of um, phallocele, uh and to a lesser extent, gastroschisis, we want to uh, evaluate for associated uh, defects that the child uh, might have. Remember again that a child with omphalocele is quite likely to have an associated defect. If they have a cardiac defect, it may be fixed and um, add to uh, the, or be more important than the uh, defect that you're actually looking at. Thermal management is important. Uh, fluid resuscitation is important. Um, uh, whether or not you uh, use a uh, an arterial line is uh, up to the uh, attending. Uh, we often do uh, Foley catheter uh, is often needed um, if this is going to be a uh, a long procedure. And fluid, fluid following the fluid and electrolyte management, urine output is um, considered to be um, uh, the standard of care. Intraoperative uh, management includes uh, can include potent agents, narcotics, air, oxygen, um, adequate relaxation. Um, the surgical intent is to close the abdominal wall, um, and surgeons will try for a primary enclosure if that's at all possible. But it often is not possible if the defect is, is rather large. For those children, they would place a silo and do a staged reduction in the, um, in the uh, neonatal intensive care unit, bringing the child back to the operating room uh, in four or five days for the, uh, for the final closure. Remember that if that, that large amount of bowel goes back into the stomach, there's an you know, increase in the amount of pressure in the abdominal cavity and that produces for babies respiratory distress, cable compression, renal compromise, which often leads to oliguria and, and hypertension. So just keep in mind that um, there are limits to the amount of intra-abdominal pressure that, that babies can uh, deal with just as there are in adults. Uh, it is the rare child that we will uh, close their abdomen and do anything other than take them back to the nursery to be uh, ventilated for a, a day or so until um, they can uh, get over this elevation in intra-abdominal pressure. Postoperatively, um, as I said, um, usually try for uh, uh, mechanical ventilation postoperatively for 24 to 48 hours. 
um, continued fluid resuscitation. Although uh, one has to be careful about this because large amounts of volume uh, will end up in the bowel and that makes um, for a, an extended uh, timing of uh, mechanical ventilation and an increase in uh, intra-abdominal uh, pressure. Uh, monitor babies for sepsis. Uh, some of these babies may require TPN, not very many of them. Uh, Post-op ileus is in fact common. Um, the mor mortality is, uh, with these children are usually associated with other congenital anomalies, especially cardiovascular and with prematurity, and not with the primary anomaly. Prior to the 1960s, mortality was uh, 70 uh, percent. Now more than 99 percent of these babies uh, do just uh, very well. Another picture of uh, a baby with uh, a gastroschisis. Let's talk a little bit about myelomeningocele and other spinal disc raphism. Um, a myelomeningocele is a congenital failure of neural cord a producing exposure of the cord structures to amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid is very caustic to the developing central nervous system and because of that um, the larger the defect produces a higher probability of, of neurologic dysfunction including failure of bowel and bladder function, motor failure of profound or profound sensory loss. So if you've got a small defect and the small defect is covered then there's less likelihood that the child will have motor failure, bowel or bladder defect. If there's a large um, uh, defect um, and the infant's uh, nervous system has been exposed for a long period of time, then the chances of them having um, uh, more normal neurologic function is uh, greater. Over the course of the last 10 years, um, at some centers, there has been a push to close these uh, in utero, and uh, the reason for that being that the people have understood the caustic nature of the amniotic fluid and want to close uh, the defect as, as soon as, as possible. The largest risk to these uh, children once they're born is infectious um, and really the rap more rapidly you can uh, close this defect within 24 hours or so as long as the baby is stable um, is uh, the better the baby does. Uh, this is urgent but um, it is not an emergent and if the baby is unstable then um, the, the surgeon should be apprised of the physiologic instability and um, and uh, we should wait to come to the operating room until the baby is stable. Antibiotic coverage is reasonable. Loss of IV f fluid is uh, large if there is a big defect. However, it is not necessarily large if there is a smaller defect. This is a uh, demonstration of a uh, rather large lumbar myelomeningocele which is uh, which is covered um, and prior to the time that it was um, that it was uh, repaired by uh, one of our neurosurgeons. This is not a myelomeningocele. This is in fact a sacrococcygeal teratoma. Sacrococcygeal teratomas are um, extremely rare um, they are large vascular tumors pres present in the fetus. They can contain uh, hair, teeth, bone. Um, removal is not an emergency if the infant is otherwise stable. Um, in circumstances such as the uh, infant that I uh, just showed you, um, it, the lack of ability to replace blood um, is sometimes become so problematic uh, that survival uh, is, is questioned. Remember that the administration of large volumes of old blood to infants um, is the most common cause of hyperkalemia and 
when these uh, children um, come to the operating room to be taken care of, it is often the fact that um, they will receive um, a massive transfusions that uh, will replace uh, their entire blood volume many times over. Again, this is a, a demonstration of a sacred coccygeal teratoma. And this is one that has been placed. Important points for, uh, for infants um, are that um, children that come to the operating room in the, in the first um, month of life um, need to be, uh, practitioners need to continue to be concerned about the amount of oxygen that uh, they are administering to the babies. Uh, a 90 to 95 percent oxygen saturation is really fine and will, um, if the baby is less than 44 weeks post-conceptual age, help you to avoid uh, RLF. However, that said, reducing the oxygen saturation to levels that produce hypoxemia um, or the variable oxygenation um, are also problematic. So maintain the oxygen levels at a, uh, at a point where there is um, not significant um, ischemia nor are there significant hypox, uh, hyperoxia. One needs to be very concerned about avoiding air uh, in IVs because most infants within the first month of life will have a, a, a PFO or equivalent, uh, meaning that the injection of air into the right side of the circulation will um, place this air in the, in the left side of the circulation very rapidly, producing um, stroke. Avoiding cold is very um, problem is is difficult sometimes in the operating room. Hypothermia is really poorly tolerated by these infants, um, and um, everything that you can possibly do to to um, keep these babies uh, warm without cooking them is uh, is important. Uh, I'm not going to touch on bradycardia because uh, if you read. If you read uh, our wiki, you know that bradycardia is, uh, is very problematic. But you also know that uh, hypovolemia is, is problematic. It's the only way to improve perfusion is to optimize the IV volume at a normal, at a normal heart rate. So that's the uh, presentation on uh, emergencies in the newborn. Uh, these are uh, things that are commonly seen uh, here at the University of Kentucky and uh, we manage them and you will be managing them in the operating room. If you have questions, please don't hesitate uh, to contact me.